okay, we're good to go. Facebook land, I love it. <laughs> Hi everybody, welcome. Just uh, going to give people time to join and settle in. Just to let you know, we are streaming live on Facebook and this session is being recorded. Hi everybody, welcome to our community conversation on online scans and internet safety sponsored by our friends at Springpoint Senior Living. Um, my name is Helen French, I'm the Director of Development and um, Education at NASW New Jersey and I'm joined with my colleague uh, Jeff Feldman, who's the Director of Advocacy and Communications. Um, we were really excited to partner with um, Mark and Kim, our presenters from Cybercrime Support Network, uh, for this important conversation. I was just on the FTC website and there was over 30 categories of online scams um, that the FTC warns us about. So, uh, you know, especially for those who are working with vulnerable populations, I think this conversation is um, going to be very interesting. Please put your questions in the chat and um, I'll relay them to uh, Kim and Mark. Um, and then we'll also invite you to be on camera. Um, we do like these to be conversations, so um, please don't hesitate to uh, put your questions in the chat box. Uh, one piece of housekeeping, when you signed up for this webinar, you agreed to NASW New Jersey's Code of Conduct, um, and we expect respect uh, for other attendees and the presenters. And if you'd like to read our Code of Conduct, it's on our website on the events page. Okay, with that, I am going to turn it over to Kim of Cybercrime Support Network, and thank you very much. Thank you. We're excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Kim Cassie Palangio, and I am a Program Managing Director with the Cybercrime Support Network, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Batchelor. I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mark Batchelor. I'm also, uh, of course, the Cybercrime Support Network. We work remotely, so I'm in Orlando while Kim is up there in Rhode Island. Um, this is a great resource um, for the people you work with. As Helen said, it's vulnerable populations who are most targeted by crimes like these, but there's also some great tips we're going to share that you can take home for yourselves and your friends and your family. Uh, so we're excited to be here. Take it away, Kim. Okay, so with that, um, the Cybercrime Support Network is a national nonprofit um, whose mission it is to serve individuals and small businesses who are impacted by cybercrime. We do that through reporting, uh, making sure that victims have a voice and are provided the opportunity to report their incident and that law enforcement is aware of cybercrime trends in the community. We also do that through recovery, perhaps financial when possible, but also recovery um, of resources and emotional well being and a sense of normalcy. And we do that through reinforcement, helping to strengthen protections and prevent another cyber incident. We have a number of great programs. Um, one of the programs that um, we'll talk about is very specific to New Jersey. Uh, this program slide is specific um, really to, to anywhere in the, in the country that you live. Um, the first one is our military and veteran program. So we provide relevant and shareable tips and resources to highlight threats and promote safe cyber practices for active military 
and also veterans and their families, oftentimes military and veterans groups will be targeted with um, cyber crimes. We also have a program called the Cyber at Risk where we will work to increase security adoption on devices for both small business owners and individuals um, this program helps people. So uh, lots of times people will hear things like, oh, you know, you should have best password practices or you should put on two factor authentication or, you know, when you're using public Wi-Fi, you should use a VPN. And a lot of times people don't, they, they hear these things, but they don't know how to implement them on their own um, devices. And so the cyber at risk program peers volunteers with individuals who need that assistance to take them through the steps of securing their devices. And we also have a program for romance scam survivors. This is a peer support program um, to help survivors combat feelings of embarrassment and isolation while teaching cybercrime awareness and education. This is a 10 week uh, program where you can refer someone um, who has been a victim of a romance scam. They, at the beginning of the, their, it's a 10-week program, they're one hour um, each week. And at the beginning of that hour, they'll learn about 10 minutes um, of cyber education and safety tips. And the rest of that um, hour will be spent uh, with a licensed counselor who um, guides them in a peer support group and at the end of those 10 weeks, a closed Facebook group is established so that they can continue connections and where we can continue to provide them uh, cyber um, educational pieces. Um, uh, before we leave the slide, uh, I should also mention a couple of other great programs we have. We have a uh, webinar series where each month you can sign up uh, for our webinars that cover uh, specific different scam topics. And we have some great um, influential guests that provide some insight on those. Uh, and we also have a new Microsoft small business program where if you are a small business that has experienced some type of cybercrime incident, uh, Microsoft is putting together some videos to help other small businesses recognize that cybercrime doesn't just happen to big companies. Um, in fact, small businesses are often targeted because they don't have big IT companies watching out for cyber criminals. And so if you would like to participate or know anybody who would like to participate, um, you can create this video with Microsoft and you can be anonymous or your business can be recognized in the video. So when we talk about cybercrime, the first thing we have to uh, do is define what is a cybercrime. So um, a cybercrime is a device that is the object of the crime. And that device can be a computer, a tablet, um, a cell phone. And so that, that device is the object of the crime or a device or the internet that is used as a tool to commit the crime. Some of the uh, common scams that we see are online shopping scams, charity scams, romance scams, and imposter scams. So online shopping scams can be that you uh, placed an order for something and when it arrived, it wasn't anything like what you thought it was going to be. Um, it can be that you ordered something and it never arrived. Uh, so there are lots of variations of online shopping scams. And of course, these are more prevalent now than ever with um, a lot of people doing a lot of their ordering online because of the pandemic. Also charity scams um, are very popular right now in the sense that you might want to, um, uh, you might see a charity that you want to assist uh, through the pandemic. Um, it might be um, assistance for food, it might be assistance for money, it might be assistance for an area that was hit hard by a hurricane. It might even be um, a donation for um, animal shelter or an animal in need. We see a lot of romance scams and we see the romance scam questions come to our website all the time. Um, so romance scams are on the rise, uh, particularly because people are so isolated during the pandemic. And imposter scams where someone may be um, posing as the IRS or another government agency or your electric company or um, a tech company that you went to for help or that sent you an email letting you know that you know your system had been compromised and they're here to help you. 
So those are um, also very common right now. So how CSN helps. So if you or someone you know have been impacted by these or other types of cybercrime, we have resources for you that can help and we have trusted and vetted resources. So you don't have to go online and try to find out what agency you need to reach out to or um, what's safe. You know, once you've been um, a victim of a cybercrime or scam, uh, you might be a little leery to just click on something and get help. And so our resources can point you to safe places to go. One of the first things you might want to do if you believe that you've been impacted by cybercrime is visit our website, fightcybercrime.org. And on our website, you're going to see, um, as the slide shows, um, a series of different things that you can click on. So if you've been a victim of identity theft, if you've been a victim of a romance scam, you click on the icon here um, for the cybercrime that you've experienced. And then on this next slide, it's going to show you uh, drill down what you need to do. So if you need to report this crime, it's going to have a hyperlink right to the IC3, which is the Internet Crime Complaint Center through the FBI. Uh, that's the place where you would report it. And it's important to report the crime, even if you don't feel as though anything can really be done, because uh, law enforcement agencies use this type of information to find out uh, what types of cyber crimes are happening where, and it really helps them in investigations, whether or not they're able to investigate your individual um, incident. And it also takes you to your steps to recover. So it's gonna take you to those immediate action steps you should take. So if it's putting a temporary freeze on your credit uh, through the three major reporting agencies, um, whether it's contacting your bank, um, it's going to take you through uh, to all the locations, including perhaps the FCC, where there might be um, something for you to fill out there. And it has the hyperlinks, everything that you need to do. So again, you don't need to search what your next steps are because it's all right here for you. Um, we also have a special section for community resources. Um, military, as we mentioned before, military veteran community, children, teens and young adults, and older adults, and their caregivers. These are populations that are being disproportionately impacted by cybercrime. So we have specific resources available for them on our site as well. And in our next slide, we also have a very robust cyber resource catalog. And this catalog is complete with national as well as uh, state um, uh, resources. And it's very easy to search. You can search by specific threat or keywords, and it's going to bring up all of the resources that link to that um, cyber incident or that keyword. And so you can go on here just to find information. Um, it's very vast and uh, it's really the first of its kind. And we also have a great resource library um, full of great information. Um, and our resource library on that next slide will show you some of the uh, materials. These are free for anyone looking for more information. They contain tip sheets, checklists, and warning signs. Uh, they're very easy to read and they're very easy uh, and free to share. Um, and if I didn't mention it already, uh, I should let you know that all of the programs that I've talked about and all of the resources that you see are all completely free. So we are a private and public funded um, organization. We receive grant funding from places like the Department of Justice. Uh, we also receive private funding um, from many um, places uh, such as um, um, Craigslist um, and um, Microsoft, um, Google and Microsoft, but you'll see that later on. I believe that's in an end slide, so I don't want to take that out. But I just want to let you know that all of our programs are free um, to anyone that you refer here. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about New Jersey specifically. So we have a program running in New Jersey. In addition to everything that we just spoke about, New Jersey 211 is our partner, and this is done through a Department of Justice VOCA grant. Um, and this is a victim of crime uh, grant, if you're not familiar with, uh, with the term VOCA. And so the funding provides for free cyber assistance 
through 211. So everything that we just talked about on that website, um, sending somebody to do that self-serve option of click here, fill out the form, click here, do this, you can have somebody walk you through that process. So if you're not familiar with 211, let me just uh, explain. 211 is sort of like the 911, but just for social services. So they run 24 seven uh, call, chat, text, they provide um, assistance to locating everything from local food banks to mental health needs and everything in between. And they also are trained now in cybercrime assistance. So residents of New Jersey can call 211, they'll get a person who will take them through that process, including asking them, have you reported this yet? Would you like to report it? I can help you fill out this report on the phone and submit it for you. And they can walk them through the steps about you know, freezing their credit if that was something that they needed to do or what support groups are available and what resources are available for them. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Batchelor. Okay, hi. Uh, how are we doing there, Helen? Do we have anybody that needs clarification or anything? Uh, all good so far, I think. Okay. Um, if you do have more questions, Kim and I are, are going to leave time at the end uh, to explain everything we're doing. Um, I'm going to talk about one last uh, resource we have in terms of partnerships, and then we're going to talk about ways that you can stay safe online. I know Kim mentioned that sometimes we talk, when she talked about the cyber at risk, sometimes we talk about the things that I'm going to describe here, uh, how to stay safer online, things to shore up your systems. And uh, I hope you do take it to heart and go home and implement these. Uh, if not, you can circle back around when our program's running and we can help you get it done. Um, but I, we're going to start with our program with Google. Uh, we've partnered with Google to create another website called scamspotter.org. And this is um, primarily to address things like phishing attempts um, and online scams, both that you get through email and through text messaging, which is called smishing. Uh, where they try to get you to click on something that you shouldn't in order to gain information. Uh, we've seen this uh, a lot. It happens to everybody. So if it's happened to you, please don't feel ashamed. It's, uh, it happens within our company. We have tests all the time and we're always falling into the trap. Uh, so ScamSpotter is designed uh, with that in mind. It's easy to use, it's interactive, it's got a quiz and it's designed to um, uh, teach you three golden rules. That's all you have to remember when it comes to this. Uh, the first being slow it down. Uh, that means, you know, scammers, they're going to try to act on your sense of urgency or try to scare you with something uh, to get you to act. It's very important to just uh, slow it down. Don't respond immediately. Think about what you're doing. Um, the next step is spot checking. That's um, when you just, after you slow it down and you say, okay, what's happening here? Just double check what's going on. If the phone call you got uh, sounds like it's from your bank and it looks like from, from your bank because they can spoof the telephone numbers, uh, take a minute and call the number on your bank statement. Call the number on the back of your credit card uh, and find out if this is a real call or not. Uh, probably 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they're going to tell you you did the right thing, this is phony, uh, and then you're not out any money. So just making one phone call or, or one quick Google is gonna save you a lot of uh, hassle, a lot of emotional uh, exhaustion and a lot of money, hopefully. And the next thing is just stop, don't send. If something looks too good to be true, uh, it probably is. The thing we talk about all the time, and I think it's something important for you to know as social workers, um, the gift card scams are just uh, horrible. Uh, it's the number one way that people are trying to, to get money because once you give that number over, that money spent immediately, like they know how to do it. Um, and you're not gonna get that money back most likely. Uh, it's, it's untraceable. So just remember, if it looks too good to be due, don't do it. If um, no government agency, or no you know, legitimate organization is going to ask for a payment by a gift card. Um, that's just not done. Uh, so ScamSpotter looks like this. It, it, it has a little interactive quiz, which gives you a scenario. Uh, sometimes they look like texts, sometimes they look like emails, and you just have to say, hey, is that safe? Is it not safe? Um, and you go through the process. There's a few questions. It says one out of five there. And at the end, you can even share it on social media with your friends and family. 
to get them involved and get them to learn how to recognize red flags uh, of a scam attempt. And that's uh, something we can talk about in another uh, presentation as well, how to recognize uh, scam and phishing attempts, red flags, um, common techniques. Today, we're just gonna do a broader overview. Um, so how can you protect yourself online? We're gonna tell you some of the easiest things you can do, uh, both for yourself and the clients you serve. Uh, we have what's called six steps to better security. Um, some of them are very obvious uh, to people who spend a lot of time online. Sometimes uh, some of them are a little more um, technical. I think we're just going to concentrate on three right now because these are, are probably the most important. Um, using unique passwords, protecting your accounts, and using trusted security tools. Just following these three um, topics are going to save you uh, a lot of intrusion upon your, your privacy and your devices uh, and your accounts. So here is what we call the password problem. The uh, NCSC has the top password li list, which is also the worst passwords list. Some of these are on there year after year. For the last 20 years, people are still using password. People are still using one, two, three, four, five, six. If you recognize any of these as your bank password or even um, an old password, please, when we're done here, go back and change it. Uh, these are easily breakable. In fact, any dictionary word is easily breakable. Uh, they just have algorithms that brute force through them and they can do a whole dictionary in a matter of minutes. Um, so we're gonna teach you how to strengthen that up a bit. We're moving actually away from passwords to things called passwords uh, or pass phrases. So there are a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, eight to 26 characters is the best because the more you have, the harder it is to break. And that sounds like I'm telling you to do something you're never ever going to remember. Um, but that's kind of the point. Uh, we're gonna try to make it easy for you. The easiest way is just pick a sentence. Pick a sentence that means something to you, that is an inside joke, something your mom used to say to you all the time, something you know, um, and then, put it together, just string together the words. Um, when they're strung together in a long thing like that, it's much harder to break. And this is a phrase that nobody in the right mind would ever guess because I don't think anybody's ever said it. Uh, so we love sitting through webinars. And then if your account asks you to throw in a character or a number, it's very easy to just, you know, do the S as the dollar sign is the S and a capital E somewhere that you'll remember it. Um, and that's one simple way to remember something that seems difficult to remember. And it's very hard to crack. Uh, another way, way is pick a phrase again that you'll remember and just pick the first letters of the words in, in that phrase. So it looks like complete nonsense to anybody who is looking at this. Uh, but for you, you're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense when it's twinkle, twinkle, little star, how into where you are. It, it's very easy, but you have a capital T there. You have a, a secondary character, a little star for a star. Um, so it makes it easier. It's like a little device to make it easier for yourself to remember. Um, don't use that one because I just put it out there in the public. And so who's to stop somebody from actually checking? The next thing we, um, we recommend is uh, two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Uh, it's also called 2FA, MFA. And basically that's when you have your account, you're trying to log into your Facebook, your email, um, what have you, and it sends you a second code, whether it's to your phone or to a secondary a device or maybe an app you have installed uh, to make sure that you are who you say you are. So what happens there is you log into your, your Google account and then you get the code and then you have to put it in there. So in order for somebody to break into that, they would need your phone, your password to your phone, and then access to both devices, uh, which is hard. Um, for most cases, you know, Microsoft says this handles over 95% of you know, most intrusion cases. Uh, you know, there are people that, that are way more technically savvy going after bigger fish, um, but for the everyday person, this is going to save you a lot of trouble um, and all you need is your phone or, or some other device. Uh, and a word about that, banks, and other organizations are doing that now in reverse. Uh, I know when I log on to my credit union, uh, I'll get a screen that has a picture and a word that I have chosen. And that's their way of showing you they are who they are, they say to be. 
So it works in reverse sometimes because as much as they want to avoid nefarious people cracking into their things, uh, they also want you to avoid going to a site that's fake. So if you do click onto something that um, looks like a bank, but it's not, and it doesn't have your password and your, your picture there, uh, you know something's up. So they're putting in an extra layer of security for you. Uh, one other thing, it's a little less known with people, but becoming a lot more common, uh, is the virtual private network. It's called a VPN. Uh, this is really important, especially for people who travel a lot. If you spend time in an airport and you want to check your email or oof, forbid your, your, your bank account or something more personal, um, do not do it on public Wi-Fi, especially in something like an airport that has a very general password. Uh, same goes for something like a hotel. Once you get to where you're going in your hotel, um, the hotel Wi-Fi is very easy for people to break into. And sometimes uh, even the most rudimentary hackers can sit there and just sweep, sweep the network for people who are using their devices and, and on their accounts. What this does is creates a, um, a relay that creates a fake network or a, or, a, or a secondary network for you to be on that they can't see. So it throws up a shield. Um, and so they can't see what you're doing. Uh, they become very easy now. My phone, uh, I have a VPN installed and it just works like a toggle. You just turn the button on and off. So if you want to hide what you're doing, you turn it on and you're a lot safer. Nobody can, can see it. Um, and if you don't have one, please don't use uh, important accounts on a public network because somebody can go in there. Uh, I'm talking to you from Orlando. We have free network, uh, free Wi-Fi downtown. Somebody can just go into the park though and create something that says city of Orlando Wi-Fi. And I could click on it not knowing, thinking that it's legit city Wi-Fi, um, but right there and they have me. Uh, and they have my password, they have my activities. Think about all the things you're doing. If you're writing a, you know, a snooty text about somebody, they can see that. Uh, there's all kinds of things that they can get their hands on into in there. So a VPN is really important. Um, they do cost to get them, but most of them uh, run about, you know, three to nine dollars a month, which is a very small price to pay uh, for security. Uh, and a couple last uh, tips uh, before we, we, we get going a little bit more. Um, don't ever pick up call from a number you don't recognize. Scammers, uh, they tag the live as lies and they sell your number. So they know once somebody picks up, they're engaging. Um, this has made our society maybe a little less social. I know I've called people from, from a friend's phone. Uh, I once got locked out of my, my house and I had to call my neighbor, uh, a call from my neighbors and my wife did not answer the phone because she didn't recognize the number. Uh, so there are some pitfalls there, but by and large, if you don't recognize it, uh, call, uh, pick up the call or just hang up. Uh, same thing with emails. If you don't recognize it, if it looks fishy, if it looks like um, there's something off about it, just delete it. Because uh, if you even engage and say, stop sending me this, again, they know they have somebody that they can interact with and they're gonna try to get in there and you're just gonna get more and more emails. Uh, and if something, uh, you know, even when it's not crossing the line into criminal, it's very, very aggravating. Um, usually if I'm talking to a group, I, I ask how many people get you know, calls from numbers they don't recognize in the hall. Everybody, I'm sure all of you, Go through that. Uh, never confirm or give your private information to anybody. Uh, you know, people will call saying they're from your doctor's office, from Social Security, from Medicare. Um, they have that information already. They're not going to need you to confirm it. Uh, don't ever give it out over the phone. Certainly don't send it via email. Um, there are privacy laws in place with the medical stuff. Um, they don't need that information. If Medicare needs something, they'll contact you through the regular channels or, or you can log into your account. And Social Security and IRS never, ever call you uh, for anything. Um, so just remember that they'll send you a letter letting you know what's up. Uh, turn off your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth when on use. Again, that goes to people trying to hack into your networks. Uh, Bluetooth, uh, now it just, you know, it used to be something you just click into your, your wireless speakers and you're having fun. But uh, check your apps carefully. A lot of them now are asking to attach to your Bluetooth. 
Um, it's because a lot of us now are turning location services off on our apps, so they can't track your movements. Uh, they're getting around that by tracking your Bluetooth movement. Um, and it's something if you don't need it, if you know, there's no reason your Dunkin' Donut app needs your Bluetooth, so just turn it off. If you don't think it's something that you need to put into your TV or to your speaker, uh, it's probably worth turning that off just for your privacy. Um, and log out of accounts after use, you know, especially if you're on a, a public computer, if you go to a library and you check something out and some of you may have clients um, that don't have uh, access to regular computer use, um, make sure that they're logging out of their email at the end of the day because the next person can go in there, see who is on and kind of test the systems for, for getting in there and they can cause all kinds of trouble on that. Um, and even at the home, you know, you know, some people with small kids, uh, I just saw weird, they, I love the weird news stories and some kid just ordered boxes and boxes of some kind of toy on his mother's uh, Amazon account. Uh, so even if it's not criminal behavior, it could cost you a lot of money. So you want to avoid that. Um, always double check. Here's how we uh, avoid some of those phishing. Double check your URLs and emails. Um, just use your cursor to go over the address bar. And if in this case, you know, the cursor is going over that something that says eBay, but you see in the corner of your screen, it says, I don't know what that says, but it's, it's not eBay, uh, which means is a red flag. Don't click on it because it's not going where you think it's going. Um, don't click in emails or in chats. If you don't think it's the right one, you'll see sometimes they'll change a letter or two. Um, or they'll do something, they'll replace an I with an L, and it looks very similar. So hover and, and save yourself. Again, it goes to stop, wait a second, uh, with the spot checking. Uh, if, uh, if you think somebody you're talking to online seems a little fishy, uh, Google Images is a great resource. All you have to do is click and drag uh, the photo that they send you into the Google Image Search. And a lot of times, if they're using stock photos or photos, unfortunately, I know this sounds ghoulish, but people who were deceased, uh, we see that in, in military scams a lot, um, people using uh, soldiers and, and, and veterans pictures to, to kind of scam money. Just drop it in the image search. A lot of times you'll get back people with similar stories, or you'll get back stock image, or you'll get back you know, somebody that lives in a different city from where the person says. Um, and if that's not a giant red flag, I don't know what is, uh, and it would take a lot of time. And finally, look for uh, the little lock, uh, the word secure, or the HTTPS, the S standing for secure, when you're on a website. Again, that can be found in your address bar. And if you see those, that means the website you're visiting has taken the steps necessary to make your interactions more secure, whether you're putting in account information, uh, your name and address, or if it's something more serious, like a, a credit card number. You want to make sure those are in place before you do so. Um, otherwise, it's um, the good bet uh, scammers are looking for those sites without that to, to try to get your information. Uh, and here's an example of that in, in action uh, with Facebook. Facebook uses secure sites. Uh, they have all kinds of safeguards to make sure that um, scammers aren't getting in because a site like that gets hit hundreds of thousand times, if not more a day uh, by scammers, uh, foreign actors, uh, home hackers, you name it, people are just trying to get in there. Um, so anything from a big site like Facebook to a small vendor uh, on Etsy maybe that you've dealt with, um, make sure that they, they're using secure information. Uh, Kim mentioned resources, and we're going to share this slide deck with Helen uh, at the end, and she'll disseminate to you. And these links are all clickable. Uh, it has it to our older adults and caregivers page because um, I'm guessing a lot of you may have uh, that population in your client base and your case management. Uh, our resource library, again, feel free to download and share anything on there um, with the public, with your client list. Uh, all we want is you to share it and make somebody a little bit more safe. Uh, annual credit report is very important. Uh, you have the right to get your free credit report once a year from each of the three agencies. I think during the pandemic, they've made that more often. Um, but please go on there and check it out. 
You can also go on there and learn, I think, how to freeze or lock your credit, which means when it's not in use, if you don't think you're going to buy a car, open a credit card, um, buy a big ticket item, just uh, lock your credit. That means nobody can try to open an account in your name. Uh, the Internet Crime Complaint Center, which Kim also mentioned, uh, again, if something happened to you, even if you didn't have a loss, it does help to uh, it does help to uh, report this because all these little incidents that they collect are crumbs that uh, can create a larger case against the criminal organization uh, and help the if FBI and, and other agencies do their job. Uh, so if they see one batch of fraud or scams in one part of the country, they might be able to connect it to what's going on in the other part of the country. Somebody might have information, whether it's part of an email address or something they said uh, that could help crack the case. So it's a, it's a, it's a, even if they can't get your money back, you're going to help somebody else and pay it out. Uh, identity Theft Resource Center is great. Um, you know, identity theft is a big issue. Uh, check out the resources they have. Uh, FTC.gov as well. Both those organizations also have venues uh, in which you can report what happened to you. And ARP, ARP Fraud Watch Network. Uh, ARP does great work. Um, you know, the Fraud Watch stuff isn't just for seniors. They have a uh, money tracker. You can um, put your zip code into their, their scam tracker, and you can see in real time what kind of scams are happening in your area uh, based on their reporting, which is a pretty neat feature, I think. Um, and that's it. We ended a, a little bit early, but I hope you have questions because we love talking to you. Uh, and all our contact information and websites that we had are also here. Uh, please feel free, free to go on them, tag us, and and uh, check out our resources. I'm going to turn it back to you, Ellen. Thank you so much, Mark and Kim. That was fascinating. You know, I think uh, internet fraud and scams, etc., can affect so many people. You mentioned, Kim, that romance scams are on the rise during COVID. And one of my friends is the mayor. He got taken by a romance scam, you know, so it's not it, I, it really can happen to everyone. So it's uh, these are really good resources. Um, we did have a couple of questions. Somebody's had their um, their hand up for quite a while and I'm tired now. Um, iPhone that begins with 973. Did you have a question? Yes. I'm mute. Okay. Luann, hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing, Helen? Good, good to see you. What's your question? So my question is, is I get the emails from like PayPal and then like I get from these sites that I know are not real because someone told me to click on the email address to see the full address and if it's not something you recognize. But my question is when I get them, do I, who do, do I report them or do I just delete them and let them go? And like, what do I do with them? You can report that. Um, the best thing is always just delete it and, and forget about it. Um, but some of the sites that we showed on fightcybercrime.org, um, they want to know if people are trying to impersonate them. So some platforms like Instagram or, or some of the social networks want you to let them know about scams like that that's happening because maybe they can track something back and try to clamp down on it. Um, a lot of them look like a mess. Sometimes you get an email that looks like, who wrote this? Is it, mm. it, it you know, it's grammar's off, there's no punctuation. Yeah. Uh, and that just shows how tricky they are. It's intentionally like that because you or me, uh, we may just delete it, mm. but the person who's not paying attention that does respond to it, that's who they want. They don't want to waste their time on us. They want to waste their time on somebody who made a mistake and they can try to rope in there. Uh, so that's why Kim and I go out there and, and we highlight these I, things. I mean, they're very savvy. I have to tell yeah. you, I feel bad for seniors who can't navigate through these types of messages. And I mean, it uh, honestly, uh, it, you know, like the way it was worded, you know, um, if this is not your purchase, please click here. If you didn't authorize this purchase, 
please click here. And to be honest with you, like I, I was like, geez, maybe I should click there. Cause that's maybe somebody got my credit card or something, you know, but honestly I could see poor seniors not really knowing how to navigate this stuff. And I, it's hard for me. So it's, it's a lot of work to have to um, figure all of that out. So it's scary. It, it yeah, is. It's, I'm sorry, it's but... not just, uh, it's not just, oh, did I, authorize something I shouldn't have. I think you're right with the seniors. It's that not fear that something's going to happen, but fear that they miss something. Right. Playing on that, that aging. Yeah, Kim, if you want to speak to that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was just going to state right before I came on this call, I was um, speaking with um, some seniors in Rhode Island and going over the same type of tips and letting them know that, um, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't purchase anything, if you, it, it's that, that it's a scam, you know, so they want to get you to think that you purchased something or that somebody purchased something in your name. Um, but if you click on that link, it's going to maybe download malware or it's going to, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to wreak havoc. So um, I go over this a lot with seniors and, and, you know, with the, it's, it's not just for seniors because I go through the same thing, you know, how many right. times I'm going through my email really fast and I'm ordering from Amazon and, and Walmart and, you know, Petco, and I see these things come up and I want to click on it too, but I don't. And what I'll do is I'll stop and I'll contact mm -hmm. customer service from that, you know, from Petco. Did you, you know, did you reach out to me because there was something wrong with my order? Um, but it is very tempting and, and they make it that way. And if you're busy and you're flipping through things fast, you, they want you to accidentally click on the link. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Peacroft, you have your hand up. I do like, mm, the question I have is, is um, there any particular, say, web browser um, that is better. We know Internet Explorer is kind of falling apart. It's no longer safe. But is there a web browser that you would say is the safest? Um, I wouldn't endorse one browser over another. Some of them are better at um, privacy. Some of them are designed more for privacy. I think um, Firefox may still be. Um, and there's, there are search engines like DuckDuckGo um, that, that are more private. Um, but they all have their pros and cons. I mean, so I, and, and I wouldn't know enough to, to uh, recommend one or another. I, I use Chrome myself and they have great um, security features in place. Um, and they, they now have a, a feature where you, you know, it saves your passwords and you can do a checkup. And, and I'm sure if some of the other browsers have that now, if you click on the checkup mode, they'll tell you if you're, password is being used, if you're using it in multiple places, which they don't, we don't recommend, you know, try to have a, a unique password for each site. Um, so they can do things like that. And all the browsers have, have security features now because they know how important that is. Yeah. Thanks. Lynn. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I just wanted to add something real quick that I've seen, uh, especially pop up around us is we're getting phone calls from who they say is the USPS. Um, and that our, our package had been delayed or could not make it. And they're asking to reach out, uh, I'm assuming to give more information, but we know that we have not had something delivered. So they've actually started using the USPS um, because everyone's getting things delivered to their house. <clears throat> Interesting. When you get um, uh, an email that looks like it comes from somewhere like USPS or your credit card agency, Try to uh, hover over that link. You know, don't click. Don't click the email address. Just hover over it, and the ending of that email address, if it's false, will not actually be going to your credit card company or USPS. Um, they're just hoping you're you're not going to look at that first. We just did a webinar with um, the U.S. Postal Inspector Service, and and their site, I think it's USPIS.gov, I guess. Uh, they have a platform where you can report something like that. So um, you might want to check that out as well, because that's a, that's a huge crime impersonating the, the Postal Service. Hmm. Lynn, you had some questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi. Oh, this is so great. Thank you so much. I mean, this is our world today, and it's uh, very, very scary. I had a 
client um, not long ago who had her identity stolen and it was just months and months of just such a nightmare as, as you know, preaching to the choir. Um, so, so thank you for this, it's really helpful. Um, so I put a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know, Helen, if you'll do those later, but um, just s simple stuff that, you know, that, you know, I just, um, one being, you know, shopping online, like that's, you know, today, that's a big thing. So even on um, places that you've not shopped before, you know, you'll go to put your name in and it pops up and, you know, your name and address is, you know, already kind of, you know, in there for you. Um, is, you know, is that on my personal computer and is that something it shouldn't be or how to get rid of that? Um, so Kim, if I cut you off, I apologize. Oh, no, that, no, that's okay, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, I can't see on here. Um, yeah, the browsers have that function where as a, as a convenience, as a time saver, they'll put that right. in. Um, and it's good. I, I try not to use it because a lot of times it'll save things that you're not comfortable uh, just putting out there, like the credit card information. It's a big time saver, but when you think about the cost benefit, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to just type in your credit card number. So how do you get rid of that? Always error on the side of little, little extra. Yeah. I, that's a good question. I, I was going to ask my IT guy next. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Usually, when you're when you're starting uh, uh, saving things to your browser, something will pop up and will say, "Do you want us to remember this? Do you want us to remember this?" I always okay. no. I don't want no. the browser to remember anything. Um, so you know, I I'm kind of old school with that. I know that there are some features with browsers that protect it, but I just choose no all the time. So mm -hmm. when you choose yes for something, it's you know it's it's saving it and and repeating it. Um, you can, depending on where you're shopping, you, you can change that and say, no, don't remember my credit card. I don't, you know, yeah. you, when you go in to make your next purchase, you can choose no. Um, uh, you know, you, and you can use just like a, a, a keeper to, to store information that, that's separate from, from your browser or, you know, you know, an old fashioned book like I have that I keep in my drawer in my kitchen. <laughs> uh, it makes me feel more comfortable. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, Chrome and, and I'm sure Microsoft have uh, something in their settings that will ask, you know, save autofill information. And you can click it no and it will, will stop doing that. But once you have some filled in, I don't know how to make it stop. Once, once you've already, that's something you might have to uh, troubleshoot. And I apologize, I'm not as, I'm, I'm, I'm great with the, the advocacy and, and a little less on the, the uh, technical. <laughs> <laughs> in most browsers, you, when you clear your internet history, it will give you a list of what you would like to clear out, and you can un, you know, click that I want to delete any right. any passwords and information. It depends on the browser, but it typically is done through your browser history. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So your internet browser history? Yes, if you're going to like clear your cache or your history. It will ask you what you want to clear in that history, and you can put saved passwords, saved data, click that, and it'll clear it out. It's always a good practice to clear that um, once in a while. Go, you know, make a note to yourself to clear that out, clear your cache, clear your, you know, your browser history. I, I do it regularly. Um, Mark, do you want to take down your presentation so we can be be Brady Bunch, if that's what our view is. Lynn, you have other questions as well that you put in the chat. Do you want to ask? Yep, you're on mute. Oh, now I can see the chat. Lynn, you're on mute. I, I, think, I think she asked, um, do, do you have an idea of a percentage of recovery regarding lost resources from cybercrime victims. So, um, so, so, so we didn't give you too much stats because we only you know, had so much time this time, but the, the stats are one, one out of four 
uh, Americans have reported. Now that's of those who have reported, one out of four have reported a cybercrime. Um, of those reported, 4.2 billion was lost in 2020. And of those who reported, there were 791,790 reports. Uh, so that was 2020. Um, I found a little bit of a stat from the FBI in 2019 that said they were able to recover $300 million of the 3.5 billion lost in uh, 2019. Um, through that Internet Crime Complaint Center, through their cyber unit, they have a recovery asset team that was created in 2018. Um, so you know, that's great, $300 million is great, but as you can see, you know, the balance. Um, yeah, and, and I know from um, previous presentations that like, let's say somebody wired some money out and they wired it out and then they went, oh, I, I should not have done that. And an hour has passed or 24 hours has passed. The closer it is to the time that you realize that and get to the authorities, the more of a chance that they could pull that money back once you hit day three, it's it's gone. Um, so, uh, and as you know, a lot of these cyber criminals are overseas, and so it poses a real problem for law enforcement officials to be able to recoup losses. Um, but they, you know, three hundred million is 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 a good amount of money that they were able to to recoup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jane. Did you have a question? Yes, I wanted to know, I very often get lots of emails that I have not subscribed to, and I unsubscribe. The ones that look weird and unusual, I just delete. But is, is it okay to unsubscribe, let's say it's from William Sonoma or something like that, or does that give your email address just more life? You know, you, you're not gonna be able to stop your email address from, from getting out there because we use it for everything. Every time we place an order, every time you wanna get the coupon at the cash register. So it's, so it's out there. Um, I unsubscribe. Again, that's another thing I regularly do. It's very frustrating. It's time consuming and you no sooner unsubscribe and then boom, 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 three new things come in, right? From like all of these stores and junks up your whole email system. And uh, it, there's really not too much you can do, but continue to unsubscribe and, you know, only give it out if you have to, but yeah, you, you can't undo that footprint. Thank you. Um, oh, no, I'm not like, uh, somebody asked, do you recommend any particular via uh, VPNs? Um, well, because they, uh, there's a cost associated. I would not want to endorse one over another. Um, I would not go with a free service. You get what you pay for. Um, some free products are very good, but when you're talking about VPNs, um, go with some trusted names. I know uh, Nord is one that's trusted. I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Kim, do you know some other ones? Um, yeah, I, 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 use Nord also. Um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank right now. Um, if you go to um, a, a trusted source, like not just ran, random person's blog, but like PC Mag, Com Consumer Reports, uh, Think Wired Magazine maybe, uh, and, and research top VPNs, you can probably find a good one for about $4.95 a month. And that's a great deal. I mean, uh, especially if you're somebody who travels a lot or uses a lot of public Wi-Fi. It's definitely worth um, yeah. doing. Yeah, if you you know, as we all get back out there eventually, yeah. if you're going to be using a lot of public Wi-Fi, you're going to be doing a lot of traveling. It's definitely worth the investment, absolutely. And you know, be careful too when you travel. Um, be careful that uh, you know you're using a public uh, charging station. Um, try not to do that. Um, try to charge in places that you feel comfortable with. Public uh, charging stations in airports can contain malware. Um, you know, carry your own extra battery. Just think, think of these things every time you plug in somewhere. When you go to the gas pump, try not to use your debit card. Try not to use your debit card for purchases like that, because if that gets hacked, it's going to go into your checking account, your savings account, and anything that that's linked to. Where if you use your credit card um, and and it gets hacked, well, the credit card company, you know, might might. Um, eat that, that, that one purchase, but it's not going to link to anything for you. It's not going to jeopardize you. So try to just, you know, think of those things. I know it, 
it's a lot to think about and, and we're, none of us can think about everything and we're not perfect. And I've made, you know, bad online purchases myself um, and, and done things that I shouldn't have done. It's, um, we just do the best we can to, to protect ourselves. And thank you, Jennifer, you shared that um, uh, NASW has a connection for discounted VPN. So yeah, definitely check those out. Uh, Lynn asked, how helpful is it to block numbers from your phone? Like, is that, is that a protection? You know, all, all the robo calls that you get, I mean, you're blocking, you're blocking. It looks like they're calls right from your area and it, you know, they're, they're not. Uh, yeah. All, all, all day long. And if you still have a home phone, it never stops ringing junk calls. Again, I feel, I feel so bad for uh, seniors, you know, who their phones just ring nonstop with, with stuff like this. But that, that's really the best thing you can do. We're, we're, in, you know, we're not going to stop them from coming in. Lock them as best you can. Don't answer them. Don't let them think it's a live number. The more you don't answer, the fewer calls you'll get. Um, so, yeah, just keep blocking. Again, it's, it's sort of like um, unsubscribing in your emails. It's a never-ending task. Are there any other questions that we didn't get to? If so, please unmute yourself and uh, come and talk to Kim and Mark. Oh, Sarah says that she got a phone call from herself yesterday. My phone <laughs> recognized it as my own number. So someone was able to spoof my phone number and call me. There's, there's all sorts of apps. Yeah, and that's one scam. I don't understand what the end game is. I'm not going to answer myself. Curiosity, I think, maybe because you go, what? My phone's calling me. Or, yeah, or they can spoof somebody else's uh, number, too, and they can pretend that they're, you know. I was just uh, so angry. <laughs> but I wonder if they're not trying to somehow um, let other people know to send a code. You know, like you were talking about, you know, the bank sends a code to use to your cell phone. If they're trying to tap into your cell phone number, if a code gets sent to them instead of to you, they can get in. Oh, like a two-factor authentication hack, kind of? Hmm. Crazy. Just so crazy. Yeah. Uh, um, somebody asked um, about the uh, recording of this. Um, they, they can see that we're recording it. Um, actually, uh, Helen is for, for, she's putting it on Facebook and she's recording it. And their question is, is there somewhere that they'll be able to view this later? They have somebody that they would like to watch it. Yes, absolutely. So um, the slide deck from this presentation will be sent to everyone. Um, thank you, Mark and Kim. And then this is being streamed live on Facebook and the recording of this webinar will be um, on our website and I'll include that link when I send out the information. Um, all of our uh, community conversations live on naswnj.org, our website, um, and they are free and available to everyone. Oh, and Jeff tells me we'll be posting the presentation on our YouTube page too. So thanks, Jeff. So, all right, uh, any more questions from anyone? I see there was one there about, um, Bill pays, uh, auto bill pay. That is up to your comfort. Um, you know, if you do automatic bill paying with your your bank or, or, or some other creditor, that's set up in a different way. Um, I am more comfortable with some sites than not. Some sites I do have click to pay, um, but most of the time I end up putting my card information in independently. It's 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 a personal choice though if you if you're comfortable with the with the vendor um, and their security and, and and the way you do business that's up to you but don't use a debit card like Kim said because it's very hard to get that money back. Excellent, excellent. Well, this has been fascinating and so topical as well. Um, I can tell from the questions, you know, people, it, it's very concerning with this digital world that we live in. Um, we hope that this is the first of a series of webinars around um, 
online fraud and internet scams. And like I said, we'll be sending out information from this webinar um, within the next couple of days. Thank you so much, Kim and Mark. You make a, a, a tough topic very approachable. So we really appreciate um, you coming on and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. Thank you. Yeah. We just give Helen your feedback. If you have a topic you'd like, we'll, we'll happily tailor to it. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Bye Helen. Bye-bye.